Well, everyone, I am Bella Spooner, Principal Associate for After School Initiatives at the Institute for Youth Education and Families at the National League of Cities, and I will be your moderator. We are delighted you could join us for today's webinar, Harnessing the Power of Data. This is the second of a three-part webinar series, Strengthening City After School Opportunities, New Sites, New Tools, with last month's webinar focusing on intermediaries and then Next month's webinar being on quality efforts. The webinar highlights a new research study, report, or guide commissioned by the Wallace Foundation and developed by experts on after school and serves local communities where this work is happening on the ground. The series is co hosted by the Collaborative for Building After School Systems, the National League of Cities, Institute for Youth Education and Families, and Forum for Youth Investment, and of course, the Wallace Foundation. I'd like to thank our communication partners who helped tremendously with outreach to get such a high level of interest in this webinar. So thank you to the After School Alliance, the Code for Community Schools, the Expand Learning and After School Project, Grant Makers for Education, Out of School Time Funder Network, the National After School Association, the National Collaboration for Youth, the National Urban League, the National Institute on Out of School Time, the National Network of Statewide After School Networks, Summer Learning Association, Spark Action, and the United Way of America. Please also plan to join us on Thursday, October 11th, for the final webinar in our series, Improving Quality System-Wide. First, let me share a word on who's participating today. We've had lots of interest in this topic. We had over 700 people register. I think we may have broken a webinar record. We <laughs> have a nice mix of leaders from various stakeholder groups participating on this call. Um, quite a bit from program staff, technical assistance providers, and a mix of funders and researchers and local intermediaries. So thank you for being on this call. Today's webinar is designed to aid communities in the best use of data for after school programs and resources for implementing management information systems for after school. Today's webinar builds on policies, tours of experience on city after school system building with support over these years from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and the Wallace Foundation. And he has developed our after school policy advisors network, which includes more than 450 cities interested in after school, uh, as well as the investment from the Wallace Foundation in 14 cities to build and strengthen citywide after school systems and fund knowledge development. We also just recently released a report last year on municipal leadership for after school, citywide approaches spreading across the country, which features 27 cities building their after school systems, as well as NLC strategy guide on collecting and using information to strengthen citywide out of school time systems. Cities really get it. They understand this word. They're ready to do it. We are excited to have two new reports, which we think are a real substantial contribution to the field, which we'll on this call. The Wall Foundation's new data tip sheets and LC's new report released just yesterday on after school management information systems. So now I'd like to introduce Chris Kingsley, our Associate for Data Initiatives at NLC's Institute. He's the author for the report. He will amend the rest of this webinar and share findings and lessons from his report and introduce our city speakers. Chris? Good afternoon, everybody. Great to have you here. We're lucky to have a couple of experienced and, uh, and thoughtful community leaders joining us for this presentation. They're deeply involved with the Wallace Foundation's latest round of investments in citywide after-school systems building. Um, we enter the conversation from somewhat different worlds. Curtis is the project manager for the Community Partnership System in Denver, which is a new partnership between the Denver Public Schools, the Office of Education, and the nonprofit community in Denver, called by the Civic Canopy, which is the intermediary where Curtis hangs his hat. Before joining Civic Canopy, Curtis was the director of information technology at a public school district in Colorado, so a tremendous resource as we talk about school community partnerships, privacy, uh, academic outcomes, and that sort of thing. Second guest, Edwin Hernandez, is the senior program manager officer for Douglas and Maria DeVos Foundation in Grand Rapids, and he's did a tremendous amount of investment from the foundation toward education and summer learning programs in Grand Rapids, including Leave to Become an Initiative, which he'll tell you more about later in the call. In terms of evaluation, uh, partnering with universities, real-time data sharing between public 
public schools and providers. Uh, there's nothing better uh, to have on this call, I think. So Kurt and Edwin are, are neck deep in this work in Denver and Grand Rapids, respectively, and I'm happy that we have them today to help us start the conversation. And it's a conversation that we're going to continue with some of our, our close friends at the Wallace Foundation and elsewhere as part of Twitter chat, uh, Twitter chat at 2 o'clock. So you're invited to join us, the Foundation, and our panelists after this call to use the hashtag AfterSchoolData, all one word, and we have a really great group of experts on hand to help answer your questions. So take a few minutes at the top of the call to help set the stage here and to share uh, some I believe we in the field already know about collecting and using data to strengthen after-school systems. About the kind of challenge this is and why we're so optimistic about several of the strategies which we'll go with you today. And I think it's worth reflecting for just a moment on how far the field has come over the decade. Uh, this community approach to coordinating after-school systems certainly has spread. It is spreading. Here on the screen is the Wallace Foundation's investment in uh, an initial five cities. Through its expansion to nine further communities in 2012, and yet, and then, by 27 cities that the Institute for the Youth Education and Families Institute surveyed in 2010 and 2011, uh, which are deeply committed to this work. A uh, fact is that the cities on this map educate one in 12 U.S. kids. And of course, you on the call today, I expect represent communities that are doing pretty similar work and that aren't captured in this map. So there's a strategy that is being explored at some scale now, and I think it's a fair question to ask, you know, what have we learned so far? One of the things I'll share is, is that it turns out data is hard. The challenge is associated with building citywide after school systems, building data systems to get reliable information may be the biggest. It's certainly the number one request we receive for technical assistance. And the leading cities and those that I, I was pointing to just a couple of slides ago don't yet have systems in place. A third don't. But they, they really need them. From a, an NLC survey in 2011, nobody that didn't have one of these systems thought that the way they were currently tracking, targeting, and coordinating their investment in after school was sufficient to support the work they wanted to do. Both so cities and communities are increasingly acting to create these systems. And I think that's, that's where, on the call today and in our work, more generally, we think we can be of some assistance. So I introduced the two resources that Bella mentioned to you earlier this year. Monday, published a really excellent series of data tip sheets and a concise, uh, just quick, accurate uh, explanation of why timely information is important to after school leaders, this is a great place to start. We're going to several of the examples from the tip sheets during the webinar this afternoon uh, and please do take a moment uh, to go to the URL listed there and download them. They're absolutely free. And Luke Held, who's the Wallace Foundation's Director of Communications, is with us this afternoon on the call and he'll be with us afterwards for the Twitter chat so you can post your questions to him. We're also extremely pleased today to announce the completion of a new toolkit, which is titled Building Management Information Systems to Coordinate Wide After School Programs. So if you're looking for uh, sort of a how-to manual for how to build out an MIS, this kit summarizes what we've learned from nearly a decade's experience, um, not the relationships and structures that we uh, think are helpful to have in place before you end, but step-by-step -step guide through the processes that are associated with, with the systems building piece of this, which can include getting a survey of your providers uh, in your community, negotiating data sharing agreements, uh, and then building and issuing requests for proposals. And there are a lot of resources online associated with the report that we hope will be helpful with that. It includes a of the major commercial vendors in the area, description of the major features of after school data systems. Uh, there are about of these that we identified, everything from reporting to grant management. Uh, and we, we have these charts comparing what you can expect from each of the six products that we reviewed. Next month, uh, in addition, we're uh, planning to publish a cost calculator so that you'll have a way of looking at the average cost of building out and maintaining one, one of these systems in your community, given a few parameters which you can input around the number of sites you plan to support and some of the specific features that you're looking for. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, I want to take a minute here here and just acknowledge the tremendous cooperation of all the vendors that we reviewed in this report, and also of the several dozen community leaders, some of you I know are on the call today, and the national experts that shared their experience uh, and their expertise. We're excited about, about the report. It's online at nlc.org slash afterschoolmis now, also for free, so please do take a moment to, to go ahead and download it. Up, we need citywide approaches after school are spreading and, and document that. We know that among the most challenging elements of the work to community leaders is the need to collect reliable information to create and improve these programs. 
stuff that we have that you know the hassle and the expense which is certainly associated with building out these MIS is worth it. I mean, this is a complex endeavor collecting information on attendance, participation, performance, perhaps case management. What I'd like to do today is walk you briefly through a few success stories with that. And the caveat is that um you and, and from our experience, your success will certainly be contingent on how specifically you can define the key questions you're trying to answer. And those things need to be relevant to the decision makers that you have around the table. There's one point that I'd like you to take away from today's presentation, uh, and remember it would be this one, which is that management information systems are not primarily about technology. They're not an IT project. The systems are mostly made up of people, uh, by which we mean educators and researchers and, and so forth, and their business decisions. Share, evaluate how they use data. And technology plays an important role there, but it plays a support role. So if you really understand the interplay between those first two, which are the people and their business decisions, the technology follows pretty naturally from it. The key point is that management information systems are about collecting information to answer questions. But assume that you know when you start these projects which questions are most important to answer. So this is a useful exercise, and it's one that we're going to kind of do a quick job of today, is to a little bit harder with us on this webinar for a moment about the people part of the MS equation and the different types of questions that different people in your community are to have within their institutional context. Begins. So as an example, funders, elected officials, a really key question at this level is, what's the return on my investment? Where are I spend my dollars to drive the biggest improvement for youth? So imagine that you wanted to reframe that question slightly to, how can I prove that schools in areas where students regularly are attending high-quality after-school programs holds fewer students back? So the students in these schools, their attendance and behavior and coursework, those ABCs, are good for the most part for them to continue on. So this is the kind of analysis that the Jacksonville's Children's Commission can do and does do longitudinally over time. And they were able to make the case that, yes, the areas with high rates of after-school participation, which you can see highlighted in black there, were likely to be advanced to the next grade, even in relatively disadvantaged communities. So the introductory data tip sheet uh, from the Wallace Foundation that we just mentioned to you tells this story of how it has been for, for Jacksonville as they work to sustain and increase funding support for these programs to be able to do this kind of work. Agencies and agency managers. Um, here, oftentimes, the issues of youth outcomes and efficiency are front and center. So, how can I wring the most value out of the dollars that I have? And then, you get from NLC tells the story of the Hartford Next initiative and how, by tracking their youth across multiple systems of care in Hartford, they learn to be just dogged about securing summer employment for youth at risk of emitting or being victims to violence and crime. So, I did those risk factors in the youth and then, like, systematically reconnecting these youth to support programs across multiple agencies is something that, that is difficult to do and anything like wholesale and systematically without a really smartly implemented management information system, the type that we're talking about today. For pro staff, the new that they can use is more often real time. So which of my children were in class today, which of my youth are falling behind in math? Nashville is the own management information system uh, on top of the Metro Nashville Public Schools infrastructure, actually. And the board that they make available to after-school providers is fabulous. For more on what a school-led MIS looks like, um, take a look at the, the profile of Nashville and the new NLC toolkit. I'll just mention that parents are, of course, a key stakeholder in after-school that are sometimes overlooked when we get into this conversation about building out systems that are focused sometimes on reporting and compliance. But I see a great example of how communities can connect parents to opportunities for after-school programming and even allow them some control over managing the selection and the payment and review programs online. Uh, take a look at, among others, the Boston Navigator, the Navigator which is supported the, uh, the InFocus Community Compass platform, also provides a number of back-end tools and a snapshot of just a, a couple of them quickly that Boston administrators give them a way of mapping program density and doing some of the types of the higher level analysis that we've talked about. So what to take away? from this quick survey is, is that we really do know what works. We're all active examples of connecting information to action in ways that get you know you more better care all across the country in communities that vary in size from quite small to, to very large in very different institutional contexts. Uh, begins with outreach and with identifying key users and understanding what they need before you build a system. And in general, kind of, 
uh, the flow of information through an after-school uh, system looks something like this slide here. So Info Programs uh, typically starts at the site, which is labeled number three. It's at 12 o'clock here. And move through the after-school agencies as you move clockwise through this. So once attend which programs of what quality. And as you continue to move clockwise, coordinators can aggregate this information and they can compare to what they know at the community already to think about, okay, how do we expand coverage and participation? And what kind of case do we make to, as we go all the way around, uh, to the funders and to the public who may all then use this reporting commission evaluations and think of the overall impact of their investment and to adjust to what and how and, and whom they fund. It's my argument from uh, consultation with a lot of cities that in a mature and a really high performing after school management information system, that's the moves information back the other way too, which is the red arrow here. Back counterclockwise, that's a chain to inform the work agencies of principals and of staff and schools to answer the kinds of questions that we had identified above. Um, probably many of us on this call tend to identify with funders or coordinating entities and maybe policy uh, people. But it's worth bearing in mind that uh, if these systems only draw information upwards to answer the kinds of questions that may be on our minds today, we're not delivering useful information into the hands of the educators and the program staff that we ultimately rely on to improve outcomes for youth and improve the lives of youth. Other word of warning, uh, well, I think we could probably all agree that management information systems aren't intrinsically useful. It's cool to build one without ever having identified questions worth answering. You can collect poor or incomplete or outdated information, which isn't worth a lot to you. You can even collect a decade's worth of really great information and just not do anything with it, which we've seen too. And this is probably worse than having no system at all in the sense that it leads to a huge potential, sometimes real multiplication of systems, uh, all tracking information, uh, which represents an administrative burden on providers. And I think all leads fields at, at that sort of ground level to be somewhat cynical about, about the use of this type of information to drive outcomes in after school uh, when they really you know, don't need to be. I also want you to take away from this presentation that we really do know what looks like what success looks like now, and that there are great examples uh, to talk about this. We have uh, two gentlemen on the call today who are neck deep in the work in their respective communities, who agree to make themselves available to answer questions about what they've learned uh, laying out these types of systems, and also I think what remains most challenging to them. So I ask Curtis and Edwin to just very briefly summarize their work before we open the floor uh, to questions today. And so we'll begin with Curtis, who, as the Canopy's project manager, uh, building Denver's new community partnership system. Curtis, could you share some of what, you're, uh, what you've been doing there and what you're learning? Thanks. Um, um, Curtis Lee, CPS project manager for the community system here in Denver. And Denver's model for, for wide uh, advancement um, kind of in the larger landscape was born out of a long history of partnerships among autonomous uh, agency providers throughout Denver and the school district and the city government. And over the years, although it's been impressively coordinated, one of the big challenges that emerged for these partnerships over time was that many of the providers were increasingly looking for academic-related re academic data um, from the school district to help them assess program impact. And as a result, the district was struggling to accommodate the increasing volume and variety of these data requests. In addition to that, uh, the City of Denver's Office of Children's Affairs was interested in updating and continuing to uh, keep a citywide directory of, of out-of-school time and after-school providers um, to assist parents finding the right program for their child uh, through a single searchable directory. So you had um, lots of disparate um, small directors that no one agency had a comprehensive list of these programs, so it was difficult for parents to navigate that. And I think in, in, in both cases, um, there was an absent, a, absence of access to data in a way that was easy to do and, and easy to make decisions around. And um, given the need for creating a one-stop um, for making this directory and data exchange happen, um, the, Help funding partners in the Wallace Foundation, uh, a coordinated entity, the OST Alliance, was developed to, to manage this work. And uh, Civic Anarchy, who, who I work for, was chosen to build and host this community partnership system, or CPS, that, that 
actually functions as a nexus or, or federates the data linkages between the different agency participants, the school district, um, the city, and then also will create a directory for parents, principals, and other people who are looking for uh, information about providers in different areas. So the idea is to create kind of a dynamic um, data exchange. And you can that this federated model uh, then has areas of responsibility that fall under the different different entities. And we all work together as a collective staff to manage the, um, the flow of of these reporting needs and 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 the management of information as it goes it flows through the system. Um, quick slide, I'll just kind of um, a little bit sort of in in more detail is within Denver Public Schools once an entity once an agency or um, a, a provider has created a profile within the community partner system um, that gives their, their directory information and then as part of their um, their step in the partnership is they'll they'll meet with the school district and begin a kind of an onboarding process which will um, orient to the, the FERPA requirements and the due diligence that, that, that then accompany any access to student data and then they'll They'll enter agreement with the school district, and will late this fall and, and into next year begin uploading their participant uh, data as fosters, excuse me, to um, to the community partnership system, and then in return, the school district will give them uh, academic related data back in a reporting format to them, so they can begin to make program impact uh, and you know begin to an analyze. Um, some of the the key pieces that will be important as the the continuous improvement model on their side. Um, and so I think just to sum up, um, the use of the data will, will be an important tool for all the different audiences, um, way down all the way from the coordinating entity, our OSD alliance, uh, for policy decisions, um, the peers' examination of program result program results to improve their effectiveness and. and both schools and parents as as customers of, of the OST programs, so they can find out what programs are available nearby, and um, how to how to get in contact with them. So that 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 sums it up on on me at least initially, and I'd be happy to answer any further questions later on around some of the uh, in the weeds aspects of sort of coordinating this work. That's a great overview. And one of the things I think it'll be interesting to put your conversation with um, with Edwin is that some of the different design choices that you made, not only, you know, with uh, significant leadership from the the city and the public schools in Denver, but then on building a system which, as you referred to, is quite federated, is agnostic about what actual system individual providers are using, um, and the type of resource that creates for you in terms of a, a master record of participation and a service directory for doing referrals, as opposed to some of the other. Um, types of work that Grand Rapids is looking at doing make a very different system architecture. So, with that in mind, I'd like to turn to to you, Edwin. Um, and Edwin has from the Douglas and Maria DeVos Foundation uh, seen the investment in the summer learning uh, project in Grand Rapids and really been out in front on these issues. Uh, so, Edwin, could you give us a quick overview of of what your system looks like and and speak some of those kind of different design decisions and what was behind those? Thanks, Chris. Uh, it's a great on the call. Uh, this afternoon, um, what we'd like to talk about is that we're pursuing a goal through the Believe to Become initiative uh, to ensure that all kids are ready to succeed in school, work, and life. And if you see the next slide, uh, that captured in the in the essence of our of our mission uh, statement there, Chris. If you could just turn that over, there you go. And and you know what, what's really key to our work is a partnership between. Um, the foundation, I would, I'd like to say that the Kellogg Foundation is also involved <clears throat> as a co-funder of this initiative, but we're also partnering very closely with the Grand Rapids Public Schools, the Community Research Institute, the ELO Network, and together, it's really, we're pursuing sort of a four-pronged strategy for why we're sharing data. First of all, it's about the rent investment, and that can only be gotten through good data for to support good top level evaluation research, but it's also about site management and helping providers on the ground have access to real-time data that help them understand the needs of children. Thirdly, it's around aligning resources, not just in the community, but also between school system and the community as information is shared 
around alignment of curriculum, which I think is where the optimum learning can take place. And so, fourthly, our our vision is really about following children over time to see what the cumulative impact that they access from learning after school programs. And over time, what does that do to the learning? And those are really important questions. This slide sort of shows you the architecture of our, of our initiative. Um, left, you'll see the top cylinder, GRPS, that's Grand Rapids Public Schools. In the middle is our community partner, our data warehouse with Community Research Institute located at Grand Valley State University, and then our data system partner uh, and focus solutions. And what, what you see here illustrated is how the data flows, starting from the Grand Rapids Public Schools through the appropriate parental consents to CRI, and CRI then becomes uh, the place that both provides de-identified information for the research team that we have in place to conduct the reach investment analysis that is so critical to our funders and the community. It also uh, provides data uh, so that the providers using NFOCUS can have access to real-time information, such as the kids are, are kids going to school uh, during the day? Are they showing up regularly? It's an attempt to try to give information, intelligence, to drive better programming. And this uh, data sharing system here is, is greatly uh, has been produced and is now in place thanks to the hard work between GRPS's vision of creating a community of learners, uh, CRI, a critical intermediary. And then the final slide that I'd like to share with you tells the story about impact. I think all of us in this sector, at the end of the day, it's about how do our collective efforts, do our collective efforts lead to results that we can show providers? And, you, and if you see here, uh, this is two years' worth of data, 2009, 2010, 2010, and 11. You'll see there, for example, at the very top, total number of, of students served in the analysis, the kids that have consents, that have fully been vetted, and that have clean data. And I think the most important, if you turn, uh, you know, if you, if you realize that the uh, the, the, the gains from one year to the next has been really dramatic, the amount of dosage that the kids have been, ac been able to access, the program, number of time spent in the program. And if you look at the math and reading results, um, have moving to, to experience last summer loss, moving from 57% to 50% or an average of um, from 7.7 .7 weeks of summer learning loss to 3.5. Those are very important dramatic results. And uh, what's exciting really about our emerging programs we're still learning is really how to help community organizations, including faith-based organizations that are part of our network, understand what it means to have quality programs, helping them to change the culture towards managing towards outcomes. And really, all this, uh, in our case, has been a learning experience, a learning curve, but thanks to the due diligence of our providers, CRI, CSR, public schools, and certainly NFOC Solutions, all of them in a team effort working towards driving better results for our children of our community. That sort of, Chris, get a good summary of our work in Grand Rapids. That's a great overview and also some great results. And I expect people want to pick up in the Q&A to ask you more about how you achieve them. So we'll open up the, the Twitter chat, which again is at hashtag after school data. And your questions uh, for Curtis and for Edwin, um, as well as for our other experts on the line there. And also, I'd encourage you to go ahead and you can use WebEx if you're on the call with us right now. We have half an hour for discussion, a little bit less. Uh, and before we begin that, I just want to finish with a, a few lessons, I think, from this webinar and to, to pull out a couple of resources that I'd like to make available to those on the call with us today. So the item is just to say again, uh, in my view, I think this is true. Management information systems uh, It's not probably technology. Bear in mind, it's the people and it's, it's their business decisions that are informed and linked through the technology. So uh, go ahead and identify your, your stakeholders, the people in this, their questions as specifically as you can. Uh, and then the actions that the answers to those questions will inform. Um, it's not it's exercise in collecting information for no reason. The technology, I think, in all of this comes last. Engage with the community. We talked about some of those key questions and, and how important it is to identify them. 
and you'll find uh, a self-inventory tool associated with the new toolkit from the National League of Cities. So I'd encourage you to go ahead and take a look at that if you think you'd find that useful. Data sharing we've, we've talked about and I think we'll continue to talk about in the Q&A is a real challenge here. It is uh, mostly about relationships, but there are some resources that can help. So I point you to a wonderful guide linked here from the Urban Institute um, from NIP on lessons on local data sharing. There's relatively uh, recently created Privacy and Technical Assistance Center at the Department of Education. They have a, a great series of online resources and are sometimes available uh, for answering uh, quite more directly from communities. Uh, and we're working with them closely to create more guidance for local communities and cities. Um, certainly associated with, with the toolkit, as I've mentioned, there are now already several resources online for download, including uh, RFP, which you're, you're free to take and modify and use if you wish. We think it's pretty thorough. There will be more of that posted I know over time, so uh, check back now and then. This fall, we're working on scheduling uh, an additional webinar just focused on these issues of data sharing, especially data sharing with schools. If you'd like more information on that uh, or more information on some of the work that we do or challenges of integrating data systems, uh, don't hesitate to drop me an email at king.nlc.org. We'll make sure you're on our list internally, uh, get information we can now, and keep you involved in our work as it goes forward. But, you know, I don't want to leave this uh, sounding like a list of challenges to be overcome. I think they actually have great examples of what works in the field. And you're really not alone in the work that you're doing. Some very successful models out there. Uh, and I hope you'll take a moment to download both the Wallace Foundation's data tip sheets, which are excellent, and the new toolkit that we put together for you. And, uh, and certainly take the time to reach out to some of the cities who we think are doing wonderful work in the area. So right now, we're going to have a couple of veterans with us on the telephone. Uh, so Edwin, I thought I'd begin with a question that was submitted by uh, Dale in Minnesota. And Dale's question was about the role of, of intermediaries um, in communities like this. His specific question was, how can or how do intermediaries affect the use of research in a city? And I'll go a step further than that, just from what I know of the role that the Community Research Institute, I think their name correct, uh, has played in Grand Rapids. And maybe more generally, what it is that they, uh, that they do for you outside of the role of the foundations or the schools from the university perspective. Perspective, and then what kind of um, are more involved with you in terms of the mechanics of negotiating data sharing and linking data and all of these kinds of work. I uh, also work with you when it comes to the research agenda and, and chasing that down. Yeah, question, Chris. Um, we, we are privileged to have a, a, an institution like the Community Research Institute, and many communities across the country have universities, have centers like this, and they perform for us, uh, two major your purpose. One is uh, to help uh, access the, the data that comes from GRPS to make it available uh, to our research team de-identified, and secondly, to then push information to our data system provider and focus solutions. Now, they happen to have a, a, a number of years of of experience already around data sharing. They were already doing data sharing with a number of community partners. And so it was easy when we came into the picture uh, to, to harness that knowledge and experience and build upon it to connect with the GRPS um, data. Uh, they, they function in, in many ways as a Switzerland to, to GRPS. The GRPS has developed great trust in them. Um, and, and, and as a result of that trust, which is critical to this work um, over time, and putting in all the accountability measures, all the audit, auditing of data and security training that is required of, about FERPA. Um, we, we, the other thing to, to mention is that we have a committee, a data sharing committee um, of a, that a number of us are, are a part of, which meets on a regular basis with GRPS troubleshooting, working through difficult issues. But at the end of the day, um, it, you know, it's a committee that, of representatives that um, work together to achieve some of these issues. At, at the, and then the final role is to support the research evaluation team um, that, we, that we have put in place uh, to support um, uh, the work. Thanks. That's useful. So, Curtis, you, you hail from an inter intermediary. In some ways, this next question, I think, is relying more your, your prior life uh, working in, on the school side of this FERPA firewall. There were a number of questions we have received about uh, about FERPA and how to uh, negotiate that from the perspective of the, the community side um, or the city side. So this question is from Ali in Burlington who wrote in, 
um, that she'd like to hear about some examples of where schools can share data with partners without violating FERPA restrictions. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think that is really conscious of, of moving carefully in, in, in the base and really trying to, to get a good feel for, for how to navigate it in a way that's um, that's conscious and, and boxes around due diligence and and so one of the I think one of the, the, the prerequisites really is to find kind of an equation where the the district or the schools um, there's a value add for them um, anticipating in in a data sharing arrangement and I think within within the city of of Denver. Just um, the volume of of really ad hoc report requests um, providers, sort of across the board, was, um, and I think all this can sort of relate to just the hunger for data increases dramatically, and the ability to sort of serve that up um, is is increasingly hard from a from a resources standpoint. In it, and I think Denver Public Schools recognized that that if they could um, recognize that and have a, uh, have a, a, a more um, centralized mechanism for having those data requests come in, a a, a non process for um, or a streamlined process for for vetting and um, creating agreements with outside entities for for that data access, and really offloading some of those ad hoc requests into a more organized realm. That that would be win win. It would it would ultimately um, reduce the stress on their staff. Um, kind of in the asymmetric re re report request realm, and at the same time, um, in real relationships with outside partners who are really looking at it to improve their program effectiveness. So I would say that my my, my advice um, primarily is is to look for an arrangement that's a win-win in the sense that people give up a little bit. Um, you know, they're going to back out slightly to sort of it will say, you know, the default answer is no, we don't share data. It leads them to sort of maybe we can share data if it makes sense to us. And I think if we can, if you can begin to sort of create decks in which there are, there is a win-win and the eye on the prize being improved um, in programs and ultimately um, improved um, on on kids participating in programs and everybody's sort of in agreement that's sort of our goal. But I think you just begin to sort of walk slowly down that road, creating environments. That's where it's sort of win-win for for uh, for moving the ball a little forward into the purpose space. Curtis, thanks to those of you who have been uh, engaging us over at After School Data on Twitter as well. This can, um, Curtis, I guess I'll, I'll start with actually. Let me start with with you. This is from uh, Isaac Castillo through WebEx, and he wrote in back to systems. Um, we'll talk first about Denver and Grand Rapids, although maybe I can add some flavor beyond that. Deal with community providers that already have their own system, which is a good question because we see a lot. Can they share raw data, uh, or do they need to do duplicate data to entry? Um, how do you avoid? I imagine he's thinking a lot of duplicate data entry in communities. Edwin, we have a, a fairly um, end solution implemented in Grand Rapids. Uh, find that you're able to incorporate uh, other organizations that are using something that is not in focus. Um, so to our Grantees, so uh, we provided the data system as part of our grant making. That you know, it was meant to be as a, a capacity building effort for the organizations, not only to collect data for the belief to be initiative, but also to help them in their own data system needs. But the beauty of having a community research institute, a partner like them that have both technology expertise, uh, data warehousing, is that they are able to function sort of uh, of a federated type of system that Curtis was talking about in the, uh, earlier. In other words, if they're providers or nonprofits that have other systems that they collect data, they're able to integrate that and create a, a, a more uh, comprehensive community um, data warehouse and, and you know or dashboard uh, of information. And we're moving in that direction, um, but what we're understanding is that uh, community uh, 
has to go at their own pace, different partnerships, different um, uh, networks, and for whatever reason, the early childhood might be functioning under a different set of data needs and so forth and so on. I think what ideally a community should have in place the ability to upload information for many number of systems and the question is whether, you know, who's there uh, to be able to provide that integrative function. And, and just in our case, uh, having the assets and the expertise of CRI is a real asset to to our work. So we mentioned, you know, the, the federated approach that Denver is taking to this problem. How much of that was driven by a sense that you maybe already had kind of an ecosystem of different systems on the ground? Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about you know, what it means if, if an organization is actually still using Excel spreadsheets and the, the YTA next door is using uh, maybe ETO? How do they relate to the system that you're building at Civic Canopy? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, it's a, an example of sort of trying to snatch a victory from fragmentation. Um, the, the within Denver is is of a really um, strong um, after school partnership culture that that has been around for for a number of years and um, so organizations and all the different people involved were sort of uh, there was a spirit of cooperation along the way but but the there wasn't really a single governance model so people were it was a it was a fragmented space from the standpoint of what they're using from us on the on the back end system side. Um, some of them are using would be using a system that was um, being led by the school district. Others um, would be using an Excel spreadsheet or perhaps have a smaller version of an MIS within their own organization. So I so coming from that and trying to solve kind of within that space, we really are designing around kind of a less common denominator approach in the sense that. We will be receiving roster data um, in its most simplest form with with enough identifiers to to match that roster data to to just an aggregate so they can get some reports back. And, and what gels take on that sort of the next level, perhaps of of integration um, with. Um, advanced types of data emerging from the providers. So I think we're easing into this, but the idea of it being kind of a, a CPS functioning as a Rosetta Stone in the middle that is um, in the, 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 the complexity for the provider so that what we're asking to do is not overly burdensome. Um, just, just get this baseline of data on a regular basis, and we will, we will kind of take the back end and, and manage that with the school district and let's see where that gets us. That'll get us further down the road than we are now. And then once we kind of get our sea legs around that, say, oh, here's some additional um, questions we'd like to answer and some additional metrics, and let's see how we can do that in a way that's also minimally impactful but still kind of keeps the ball rolling from a quality improvement standpoint. Does that make sense? And I think one of the, the elements you're both pointing to is the importance of having some kind of coordinating entity, which is why... Uh, LC and the Institute for Youth Education and Families has been a strong advocate for these citywide or community-wide systems. I think it's very difficult for a single organization, for a boys and a girls club, to do this kind of work. I mean, they have a whole series, I think you're <laughs> having negotiated these, of bilateral information sharing relationships. As you said, you need somebody to be uh, the Rosetta Stone or the, the Data Switzerland is another term I, I like a great deal. Um, I'll add to, to both of your comments to say there's really two pieces to the question, which I think anybody on this call that's interested should bear in mind. One is the technology piece, and, and please do work with any of your technology providers to get assurances that they do uh, the best they can to be interoperable with other systems in the community. And um, if you want my further thoughts on the matter, feel free to give me a call, and I can let you know there's certainly some good solutions out there. BS is partly a question of data definitions, which is it's not only that your system speaks to one another, um, to Isaac's question, that all of you are defining things like attendance and participation and the outcomes you're tracking in the same way. Otherwise, even if you can sort of match students up between systems, you really are comparing apples to oranges. And if you want an example of a community uh, that I think has done a very thoughtful job of negotiating both the question of how the technology interoperates and uh, establishing data definitions pretty early in the process and then using those to drive effective evaluation across programs, Take a look at, at Omaha, and there's a case study 
on their work in the NLC tool guide, and I think additional work coming out shortly uh, under uh, in focus's label. So you can keep out for those. Um, I wanted to just briefly address one question from uh, Maria Dwyer. Asked, you know, what the cost of of implementing a system like this is. Really good question, and it's the first place a lot of us start when we need to go and, and fundraise and think about uh, how we want to uh, try to scope a project like this. Uh, we'll have an online cost calculator for you available in about a month, which will give you generalized information about that. Um, I can't share the specific cost um, purpose of each of those systems that very generously provided to us by the vendors because those are their own information. But we give you a range. It'll give you some sense of what you're dealing with, one year, two year, five year implementations. And if you need sooner than a month, you can reach me at the contact information on the slide there, and I'd be happy to, again, give you that generalized information. Uh, so well, another question, um, Edwin, maybe I'll direct this one to you. This is Samantha and Yonkers wrote, a primary reason for data collection uh, is only to chart impact, but also to share that impact with funders. And I think you occupy an interesting role here, being both a funder and I think having done work like this, where you're building partnerships for additional funding and really trying to demonstrate impact itself. Could you talk a little about the way you view um, management information systems after school in that light? What do they provide that you wouldn't otherwise have? What don't they provide that you wish they did? Good question. I think that you know, we're under, obviously, but I think more and more funders across the country are raising the bar around the cues of, you know, is this investment making a difference? Are kids learning more? Are they you know, the skills that these programs are, are meant to to instill or to teach and so forth. And so, what answer to 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 that demand that our particular trustees were asking um, then meant that we needed to have in place data systems, but not data systems to collect good data and clean data, but also to have people, the the, the human capital, the, the researchers that could take that information, partnering with the district, and set up a research design that could help answer from the most simple questions around pre and post, moving from the less rigorous pre and post type of analysis and evidence, to to having control groups or by children that are not receiving the, the, the treatment or accessing the program, so that you can compare whether indeed the differences that you're seeing are indeed due, are more likely to be due to the intervent, the after-school intervention, for example. And so for us, having this research infrastructure was a direct response to our trustees' vision. And they understood that if you want to raise the bar um, on evidence, you have to invest in research and development. And so uh, luckily we had players in the community, we had people internally to the foundation that can speak to these issues. So. And, and I think as a result, our, our, our fund, our trustees, uh, our, our, they understand the complexities of these issues because of, of this work. They understand that, that what the value that it brings to them as they're making decisions, but also to providers when you provide uh, evidence about the, the effectiveness of their particular program. And so it's changing the conversation between donors and providers in a new way. And we're seeing that happening in Grand Rapids, but clearly... Uh, you know, in mind as somebody who 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 has been in this work for uh, three years now, um, there's no greater work than to help providers uh, gain access to more funding than to give funders, donors, the information uh, on impact around how their work is is showing up in the lives of kids. Thank you, Curtis. I wonder if there's a similar question to Denver and. And that you're going to have shortly here a really uh, spectacular association of of, of you and the programs that you participate and the consequences of that participation, uh, ideally on um, on attendance and behavior and coursework in the schools, because you'll have that link to the public schools. What levels at which you get sense folks in Denver are thinking that through in terms of what resource that provides to the programs, as Edwin said, to talk about their impact or to the schools and to principals. I think um, Edwin's articulated it really well. I think there's that that I think the ecosystem captured this sort of an entire um, collective of people who are working on the on 
on the design elements of effective programming and other people who are really looking to, to then make some decisions around focus areas or what, what seems to be working what's not. And I, I think in, in Denver, the, the formation of the Out of School Time Alliance, the OST Alliance, as the coordinating entity is is really powerful um, step in the sense that it, that the the committees that will, will be uh, within the OST Alliance are, are really organized around addressing these key questions. And so in addition to the the CP system providing kind of that this directory function and data exchange function. It will also then be providing a supportive role for for some deeper analysis, um, kind of in the quality realm. And and I think the theory of action is that the OST Alliance sort of being um, charged with really moving this quality work forward these, through the use of these subcommittees will be able to to really dig deep. Define um, questions that are really that a lot of different people are trying to answer. Funders, um, school districts, um, agency providers, really identify these key questions. Define um, data data capturing to really and, and sort of you know metrics around those, and then really track that moving forward in a really concerted way. And so I think from their standpoint, the 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 development of the entity, the the coordinating entity. Is good that because that'll be really their primary focus, and so that allows um, as a sort of a singularity of purpose, which I think will really drive the work forward rapidly. So we probably have time for just one more question, and I thought I would uh, grab one from Joan Altabelli, who asks: In what systems um, nonprofit and for-profit agencies coexist peacefully? In your experience, uh, are, are providers given access to student data for curriculum development uh, equally? And to groups of students with similar needs, or is there sort of preferential access to one group or another? If you has a perspective on that, we haven't seen any here in Grand Rapids. We haven't seen any preferential. I think that the whole thing is that whoever is working with children have quality programs in place, you know, and and are willing to uh, meet the expectations around data security issues and and quality programming are certainly welcome to the. Table. Yeah, I concur. I think that um, the one articulated it really well, and I think the the everyone's sort of welcome to the table um, to sort of improve the lives of kids, and sort of the I think the operating principle that sort of underlies all that. That seems like spirit to on. So I want to say, uh, Edwin Curtis, thank you both so much for being with us today. Um, this webinar for all of you uh, on with us still will be archived on the Wallace Foundation's website and also on the National League of Cities website. You can join us again on Thursday, October 11th at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern for the final topic in this series of three, which is proving quality system-wide. And that session will be moderated by Nicole Yohalem of the Forum for Youth Investment. Uh, out, if you will, as well for an upcoming session on data sharing between schools and the community partners, uh, which I mentioned that NLC will coordinate later this year. And we're going to close out the webinar now. Um, but the conversation will continue for at least another half hour online if you'd like to go join us with hashtag after school data. Uh, there's a whole set of us, not, not even uh, only the speakers in the NLC and Wallace Foundation, but ready to answer questions and bring you to resources over there. Before you go, if you would, um, we have just a few brief survey questions on the webinar about whether or not this, this is useful to what else might be. So if you could take just a moment and fill those out, we'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for attending, and we'll see you over on Twitter in a few minutes.